As I said during our announcement time, this month is about stewardship. And uh, one of the important doctrines of the church, as well as in the Bible, is uh, stewardship. That's why we have to give emphasis on this important truth from the Holy Word in order for us to know and better understand our role as human beings here on earth. There must be a purpose why you are here, why we are here in this world. There must be a purpose why God created us in the very beginning. Otherwise, if there was no such purpose, he can just create animals, no human beings. But uh, the Lord has specific purpose for all of us. And uh, that's the thrust of our meditation during this month, especially today. And I'd like to invite you to just bow your heads for prayer. Father God, again, we seek the presence of your spirit and uh, to give us a better understanding and knowledge and wisdom to know this important truth from your holy word today on stewardship. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of our theme or our lesson today is the unfaithful steward or other version they call it the dishonest steward or in modern lingua or in contemporary lingua, language they call it the crook steward the cheat steward and in the bottom right there in the screen you see a good lesson from a bad example Oh, you might wonder what is that bad example where we can get a good lesson? It's not all good lessons or good example that we get good lessons. But this one is a bad lesson or a bad example, but there is a good lesson that we can get. So let's try to digest that today. You know, there was once a man who went out ocean sailing, or he was on an ocean voyage. He was carrying a bag of gold coins, a bag of gold coins, and he was there in that ocean uh, voyage, and that bag of coins represented his net worth. That was his total net worth. He placed it in a bag, those coins, and he brought that in an ocean village, or in ocean voyage. What happened was this. There was a terrible storm that blew up in that ocean voyage of his. And so there was a call from the captain. Came a call for all hands right there in that ship to abandon the boat, abandon ship. Because this is not just a mere storm. This is a perfect storm. Abandon ship. And so what happened, the man with the gold coins in his bag strapped his bag right in his waist. He strapped it in his waist, around his waist, and he jumped overboard. He jumped overboard. You cannot see there the man because it's so stormy. <laughs> so he jumped overboard and he sank to the bottom of the sea. And here's the philosophical question that I'd like to bring you today. As he was sinking, did he have the gold? As he was sinking, did he have the gold? Or did the gold have him? That's a philosophical question that I'd like to bring to you at the very outset of our meditation today. You know, I find it significant that one out of six verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three Gospels, it deals with either money or material positions. One out of six verses among these three uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one out of six verses deals with either money or material positions. And over half of the parables of Jesus, you know, Jesus spoke parables, told stories or parables. There were more than 50 of them, parables. More than half of these parables 
He addressed about money or material positions. That's more than 50%. And we are told that over 1,000, there are over 1,000 references in the Bible that speaks about money. Over 1,000 references. This makes it the second most popular subject in scripture. Why such a major focus, you may ask? Why more than a thousand references? Why more than 50% in the parables of Jesus deals with money or material positions? You know, how many of you have learned from experience that if you don't manage your money, it will manage you? Have you learned that experience? If you don't manage your money, it will manage you. Finances affects every area of our lives. Finances affects every area of our lives. You know, home life, <coughs> look at that. Home life, uh, unhappy home life. 75, 79% of course of couples state that finances are a stress in their relationship. The next closest was indifference to feelings. That's about 30%. But 79% of the reason why there are always stressful living in a kind of house that they have or home they have is because of finances. And according to a Gallup poll conducted, a survey, Gallup poll, they discovered that 56% of divorces in America occur because of financial tensions. Now this morning we will focus on a parable that teaches a story or a parable that teaches God's principle for managing our money, your money. You have your analog Bibles with you today? Or if you have your digital Bibles, your smartphone, smartphone or tablet, whatever, use that in our study today. Open your analogs to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, 1 to 13. And you will find there, there the most controversial, controversial parable of Jesus. Maybe some of you have read that. And maybe some of you were confused. What did Jesus mean? Why? about this particular steward, an unjust steward, but he commended him. Isn't that controversial? Let's read that today piece by piece and get the gist out of that particular parable. Now the story is from one to eight. That is Luke 16, one to eight. For a possible answer to that question, I would like to consider these passages. Now, this passage is generally, generally called the parable of the unjust steward. Let me say this first, that this parable generated, <coughs> this parable generated an enormous amount of controversy over the years. Because on first glance, on that particular chapter, it does not appear that it does, it does have any redeeming value or any feature about redemption, as we shall see in this study. It is the story of how a particular person, of how a man cheated his boss. This man cheated his boss. To make matter worse, after Jesus tells the story, after he told the disciples and the people around, especially the Pharisees and the scribes, after telling them the story, he, he in essence say, you should do the same thing. After telling that story, you should do the same thing in essence. Now in his commentary on this passage, famous, um, apologist William Barclay says that it contains a choice, a set of rogues as one could meet anywhere. And it's true. It's true. The hero of this story is really a villain. He's a villain. He is a cheat. He is a crook. What happens here could have happened in London, could have happened in New York or it could happen in Los Angeles or Chicago. It is life from a basement view. 
from a basement view. One man stiffs his boss and seems to get away with it. That's why the story is all about Jesus tells a story and then draws a good lesson from a bad example. Now first, let's have the accusation here. The story begins this way. Just mark that particular chapter with your you know, finger or open, open that Bible of yours. It begins this way. Once there was a rich man who had a steward working for him. Now when Jesus said rich, well, of course, he means extremely rich. Extremely rich. Now, this man was a multimillionaire. He was so rich that he never had to work for himself. He was extremely rich. So, because he was rich enough, he owned a large estate and rich enough to hire a man to run the estate for him. And so, this man he hired was called a what? Steward. He hired his steward. We could, we could, have, we could also call him a, a manager. In other words, a manager. So in Bible times, the steward was a man of immense power. In Bible times, if you're a steward, you have power, immense power. He had the absolute right to hire and fire that steward during the Bible times. He had the absolute right to hire and fire. He had the right to set the boundaries, and he had the right to set the salaries of his workers, of the employees. He controlled all the business affairs of the estate of his boss. He made the deals. He bought and sold crops and cattle. He haggled prices up or down. That was his work. The steward ran the whole show. He made all the decisions. He was answerable to only one man, and that is the owner. That meant that the steward had unlimited, unlimited power. Power to do things wisely, and power to do things foolishly. That's why the number one qualification for a steward was faithfulness. Number one qualification of a steward, was faithfulness. He had to be loyal, for if he is not, he is not loyal, he could cause a lot of mischief. So in the story that Jesus told, the steward had been accused of squandering his boss possession, according to this story. He squandered his boss position that amounted to a large and deliberate mismanagement. This steward mismanaged his boss properties. What had this steward done? We don't really know. What did he do with the, the way that he managed? Perhaps he was skimming off the top for himself. Perhaps he was underpaying his employees. Or maybe he had put some of his deadbeat buddies, employed his deadbeat buddies on the payroll. Or perhaps he was gambling with money. We just don't know because that chapter there did not mention of how he did the management. What we know is this in the story. The word got out. Well, there was a word, there was the news. It always does, doesn't it? What was the news? You can cheat, you can cheat just so long before someone else finds out what you are doing. Yes, you can cheat out so long, but someday, somebody will find out what you're doing. And when it happens, you almost will never figure out how they caught on and how you were caught. But they do, because sooner or later, the cheaters always get caught. The cheaters always get caught. And that's the whole point. This man had been caught red-handed. This story is not about how he got into trouble, but how he gets out of trouble. That's the point of this story. The story is not about how he gets into trouble, but how he gets out from trouble. So the boss is so mad, terribly mad. In verse 2, take note there in verse 2, he plainly says, you cannot be my manager anymore, according to the boss. According to the rich man, you cannot be my manager any longer. And so he orders the man to give an accounting, and then he says, by the way, you're fired. 
you're fired. No second chance, no appeal. The purpose of the accounting is simple. The steward must total up all the books, clean up all the details so he can hand the things that he did and then go to, over to the next man, whoever will be the next steward or the manager. So the boss stands up, the interview is over, the steward walks out with his head bowed down. He has one more job to do, and then he's out of work. What will he do? What will he do? He's an, in a disparate situation, very disparate, because there is no market for unfaithful stewards. He was fired because he was an unfaithful steward. And when he will look for another work, I, I'm sure he will not be employed because there's no market for unfaithful stewards. So he was very, very disappointed and disparate. So words had gotten around who would hire him an unemployed crook. Now verse 3. He began to think about the possibilities. All right? Two things come quickly into his mind. Digging ditches and begging. Digging ditches and begging, but neither one fits for his job profile because he is too weak to dig and too proud to beg. Well, if you don't dig and if you don't beg, you're not going to eat. Nothing. So they say that necessity is the mother of invention, and this man needs a good idea. And right there and then, he gets one. One idea. And the good idea that he gets is the whole reason that why Jesus told this story. The reason why he got this idea, and the idea that he, he thought, is the very reason why Jesus told this story. Let's go to the scheme in verses 4 and 7, 4 to 7. The steward concocted, invented, in other words, a very simple plan. What was the plan? You know, he still had a job for the moment. He still had a job for the moment. He had been fired. But the firing had not taken effect yet. He was given a few hours. It has not taken effect yet. So time is short. Time is of the essence for this fired steward. And his situation called for on the spot ingenuity. In verse 4, he says, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. What was that? He said, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. That last phrase is the key. People will welcome me into their houses. How will he do that? Or how will the other people will do that? Welcome him. He's a crook. He's a cheat. So he's looking for a way to take care of himself once he loses his job. All right, now the plan is simple in itself. As a steward, he had absolute authority. He still had the authority because the, the firing was not in effect yet. So as a steward, he had absolute authority in making deals with the people who did business with the estate by manip manipulating those prices. He could win friends for himself and friends who would remember him after he lost his job. So what did he do? This is what he did, according to this story. He made two quick deals. He was looking for one person. He was looking for that first man who owed the state 100 measures of oil. There was a man he knew, because he was the manager, or he is still the manager, that there was a man who owed 100 measures of oil, roughly 850 gallons of olive oil. 850. So he was looking for that. And when he found that, the steward had the man take his bill. Okay, give me, the, give me your bill. Wrap out the 100 and write in its place 50. That's 50% discount right on the spot. All right? He was looking for the second deal. The second deal was with a man who owed 100 measures of wheat, roughly 
1,000 bushels of wheat. And so he said, give me your bill. Give his statement. He said, rub out the 100, write in its place 80. Write there 80 instead of 100. That's a 20% discount. What it meant was obvious. What it meant was obvious. These two men suddenly received a discount. Right there and then, discount. Imagine there's so much awe or debt to their boss, but here's their steward telling them it's a deal. Okay, cut it. Instead of paying uh, our boss 100%, it's 50% for you. Discount. The other one, because you have 100 measures of bushels of wheat, okay, cut it into 80, you'll have 20% discount. Once they, they hadn't expected, one they didn't deserve. So the, 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 the steward figured that a free discount would make these people happy. He was right about that. The two men didn't know why he did it, but who cares? Well, we, we have discounts anyway, who cares? So they took it gladly, and suddenly the steward had become their friend because they were given discounts. <laughs> now, and that brings us to the end of the story in verse eight. What happened? Verse eight, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted what? Shrewdly. He was very smart. So the master commended him. That suggests two things here this morning, my friends. First, that rich man knew what the steward had done. Second, the master knew a clever deal had been going on, and he saw one. But how could the boss commend this crook who had cheated him time and time again? Because, you know, the steward, the manager, used his opportunity to prepare for the future. He was looking for what will happen because he's going to be fired someday. So he was trying to prepare something for the future. He was thinking ahead. He was taking care of tomorrow. That's why the master commanded him. But the question remains, why did Jesus tell this story at all? Why? What possible point could be drawn from it? You can see why the parable is controversial. It is just a slice of life from the business world held up for our examination. You know, a crook or a cheat is caught. A crook is confronted. A crook is examined and then eventually dismissed. But before he is fired, he takes one last opportunity to feather his own nest. This is not a hint, or there is not a hint of Christianity anywhere in this particular story. Jesus' own explanation is in the second half of verse 8, why he tells the story. The second part of verse 8 says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. That's Jesus' explanation why he commended this dishonest steward. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. You should circle two phrases of the text, or two phrases of the text. The people of the world, and then the people of the light. You could simply say the people of the world and the people of God. There are two groups having or living according to two separate set of rules. You know, the people of the world, living one way, and the people of God living another way. But in some ways, my friends, the people of this age are wiser than the people of God. Why? Because, you know, they plan for their own future. And that's why Jesus is commending, not the stewards' dishonesty. He did not commend the, the stewards' dishonesty. Let's be clear about that. He did not commend his dishonesty. Not his base self-interest, no. But the fact that he looked into the future, saw what was coming, and used his opportunities to make wise plans. Here is a fool who is wiser than the wise. 
The surprise is that Jesus says unbelievers are better at planning their own future than believers are. They live in this world and make plans for their own future in this world. We who are the sons of God live in this world, but we have seen the light of eternity. We know there is another world to come, but we don't make any preparation for it. Get it clearly, my friends, brothers and sisters today. Unbelievers see only this world. Unbelievers, they see only this world. But at least they plan for the future they can see. You know, we see two worlds and live as if the next one does not exist. We who are believers, we live in two worlds, but we only see one as if the other world does not exist. The point of the parable is this. We ought to use our present opportunities to prepare for the world to come. We are wise if we do and foolish if we don't. So what are the morals of this story? The morals are found in verses 6 to 19, or 6 to 13, or 9 to 13, I'm sorry. The first moral of the story is, in case we missed it, Jesus added three morals. The first one is found in verse 9, foresight. I tell you, according to the parable, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That's foresight. I tell you, use worldly gain or to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Some translation use the phrase, the mammon of unrighteousness or unrighteous mammon. They call it that way, unrighteous mammon. It stands for what? Money. And all that money can buy. That's mammon. The other name for mammon is money. The mammon of unrighteousness. This is Jesus' investment advice for all of us. We should use our worldly wealth to make friends for ourselves. That's what the unjust steward did. Remember in the story? He made friends. That's what we are to do. Because Jesus commended that aspect of that unjust steward. Notice the reason he gives. Why did he say that? Why did Jesus say that? So that when it is gone, what is the it? He is talking about what? Money and everything money can buy. When money is gone, when money fails or no more, money fails, it fails in the end, five minutes later you are dead, somebody will have your money. Five minutes after death, your checkbook will be useless to you. On that day, it won't matter whether you live in a mansion with a swimming pool or in a hovel on the wrong side of the tracks. Think of it. All you lived for and accumulated wealth of a lifetime, everything you dreamed about and every cent you ever saved, every investment, all of it is gone forever because it will fail you in the end. Money. Money will fail in the end. After a rich man dies, people often say, how much did he save? The answer is always the same. He left it all. Nothing was saved. The question is not, how much did you make? The simple question is, how did you spend what you had while you had it? That is the point there. The question is, how did you spend what you had while you had it? Did you buy houses? Did you buy lands? Did you buy stocks, furniture, new cars, new clothes? Is that all you did with your money? What was the goal of your life? Or did you make friends for God with your money? There are only two choices, brothers and sisters. Friends, the issue is not getting rich versus staying poor. That's not the issue here. It isn't between the stock market and Jesus. No. The issue is this. How did you use the money you made? 
Did you get rich for your own sake? Or did you use whatever wealth you had to make friends for God? But that's not all the text says. It's not all the text says. It says that you should use your money to gain friends who will welcome you into eternal dwellings. What do you mean by eternal dwellings? That's heaven. Make friends. Because when you get to heaven, those friends that you made friends of your worldly wealth will be very happy. Because they will say, thank you, my friends. My friend, it was you who invited me here. That's heaven. Jesus is saying that we should use our money to make sure people get to heaven so that they will welcome us into heaven when we get there. Let me ask you some questions. Will anyone be glad to see you in heaven? I'm sure you will be happy. If somebody will meet you there in the pearly gates, thank you. Thank you for getting me into this place. Will anyone hug your neck and say, thanks for making sure I got here? Thank you. Will anyone be there because you made friends for God with your money? When you pass through the pearly gates, will there be a standing ovation from the people you who helped you in this life? Or will all the things you spend your money on this world is just left behind? And all the people you knew began to some other place. The next moral of that particular parable is faithfulness. Verses 10 to 12. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. You see there the text. This is the New International Version. What is the very little there? The two words. What is the very little that, is, that Jesus is talking about? It is the money we make and the wealth we accumulate in this life. To God, my friends, it is very little. It is very little. In light of eternity, it amounts to pocket chains. Even the man who has millions of dollars has very little as far as God is concerned. To us, a man like Donald Trump or Bill Gates is unbelievably rich. But to God, it's just peanuts. God to God is just peanuts. It's not how much you have, but what you do with what you have that matters to God. That matters to God. It's not what or how much you have, but what you do with what you have that God is interested. That's where the much, the word much there comes in. The much refers to what? Eternal wealth. Eternal wealth. Jesus is saying, if you have messed around and wasted your worldly wealth, why should I trust you with the stuff that's really important? That is, our future wealth depends on how we use our present wealth. What we have now, my friends, we must someday give up. What we have then, we will keep forever. And that brings me to what I think Jesus would say to us. Listen in verses 11 to 12. So, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? That's Jesus telling us. You know, today is April 23. In just a few days, most of us will be receiving a paycheck. We'll put it in the bank when we receive the paycheck, maybe, and most of it will be gone before leaving the parking lot. What difference will it make how you spend your next paycheck? What, what difference will it make today, tomorrow, or even 10,000 years? As the, as, the, as the child is the father of the man, so time is the father of eternity. What we are today is what we shall be in eternity, my friends. If God cannot trust us now with this piddling stuff we call money, 
How will he ever able to trust you with true riches? The point in this story is the point for all of us. Everything we have received has been given to us in trust. Everything we have received, everything we have today, they are all given to us in trust. Some people, you know, get rich because they have some other ways of accumulating that affluence or that wealth. Others, like us, we get our paycheck. That's the only difference. The money we have is loaned to us. It is just loaned to us. Someday, we'll give it back, and God will give it to someone else. The question is not, how much did God give us? That's not the question, because it varies from person to person. Some have more, some have less, but in God's eyes, it is all what? Very little. Very little. The bigger, all important question is, what have we done with what God has given us? That is the question. That's the question that God will ask us someday. We'll have to live with the answer for a long, long time. For a long, long time. And the third moral of this particular story is fidelity or fidelity. Here is the end of the story in verse 13. Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Why? Because you cannot serve God and money at the same time. This is the test of fidelity, which means fixed loyalty. Fidelity means loyal, fixed loyalty or exclusive allegiance. You can have Christ as master or you have money as your master, but you cannot have both. No, because you cannot serve two masters according to the Bible. The two masters will never agree. They will never agree. You must choose whom you will serve. I'll tell you what our problem is. We're spending our money as if we will never, we are no, never going to die. We're spending our money as if we're never going to die. We're living as if there is no tomorrow. We're investing as if there is no world out there. There is no final world, no. But we are blind to reality if we live that way. Because one day, one day, you, me, are going to die. They will put us in a box. And then they will, they will will you. They will will you right here. Plus you right here. Then, while you are there, somebody will say nice words about you. Then somebody or people will cry a little bit. And then will you out to the hears. Waiting there. After that, they wheel you out to the hills. And then after that, they will take you to the cemetery. And once there, they will say a few more nice words, have a prayer, and drop you into the hole. <laughs> Throw some dirt, shake hands all around, those who were there, and then we'll go over and have a party at some buffet restaurant. That's it. That's reality. But some of us think that's never going to happen. We're living as if we were never going to die. But friends, we are. We are. That ought to make you stop and ask few sovereign questions. These are the questions. What am I living for? What am I working for? What am I investing in? What will I have to show for it in the end? Folks, don't be afraid to give your money away. You cannot keep it anyway. Again, the three morals, foresight, faithfulness, fidelity. Some of you may be wondering why, you pastor, I, I, why are you bringing this all up today? I have goosebumps already. I may not be able to eat my potluck today. It's because the way we spend our money is a crucial issue. 
We believe that God doesn't need our money. We believe that. Nor does he want us to give it grudgingly. God does not want you to give that money grudgingly. No. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. Give it cheerfully, not grudgingly. 1 Corinthians 9, 17. God is the owner of all that we possess. Everything comes from you, O God. And we have given you only what comes from our hands. 1 Chronicles 29, 13. There are two steps, my friends, I want to take by way of application. And this is the last. First, I want you to go home and think about what I have said. Check it out. Go back there and read the text for yourself again. Evaluate my words. And then decide for yourself if I told you the truth this morning. And then second, I want you to do a checkbook checkup. Check your checkbook. To do that, take a blank piece of paper. Take a blank piece of paper and then put the line in between of that blank piece of paper when you get home. And then on the left side, study these checks of yours, the checkbook for the next 30 days. On the left side, put the heading, the world, or this world. On the right side of the column, put the other heading, eternity. Eternity. Study the checks you have written in the last 30 days. Each one will belong to either the left, which is this world, or the other check will belong to eternity in the right column. How much of your money in that last month has gone for this world? And how much of that money has been invested in eternity? I'm not suggesting what the proportion should be, but I think you should find out where your money is going. My friends, brothers and sisters, and our guests today, God does not dictate how much we should give in offerings, but always blesses both those who return their faithful tithes and those who are generous in their offerings. I encourage you, including myself, to put God first. Matthew 6, 3. You're familiar with that verse? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. That's first. And all these things shall be added unto you. Encourage, I encourage us to put God first and return your faithful tithes as an expression of your faith and trust in him. You'll want to give a generous offering proportional to his blessings too. And you will be blessed as a result. May the Lord bless us today. Amen.